again with another story from our hometown scrapbook by Ben Weatherwax. In one of our readings from the scrapbook, we dug out a yarn about Captain Whitcannot, the master of the Roy Summers, the burly German deep water man who whipped Charlie Johnson, Aberdeen's town bully, along the turn of the century. Well, that yarn was so full of strung together events and necessary details that we hardly had time to really tell you about the skipper himself. Captain Whitcannaw was one for the scrapbook. If a real saltwater character ever lived, it might give us the idea of what went on inside his thick tectonic skull if I tell you that he argued that the world was flat. Sure, he could navigate his ship by a sextant and celestial observation. He knew that the sun came up on one side and went down on the other. He had come over many a horizon and taken to landfall with rising views. But for his money, and he had slugged the man who disagreed with him, for his money, the old world was as flat as a Swedish pancake. Otherwise, what kept the water from running off? And when they talked of the rough man, they must be compared with Captain Wickena. Nothing like him has ever hit this salt-crusted port. He kept a full-size bar in his quarters on board ship and took his shore fun the hard way. He fought for fun. The more that opposed him, the better he liked it. The late Captain Benham once recalled that Wickena, or White, as he sometimes called himself, whipped six men single-handedly on an Aberdeen street corner one quiet evening, or to be exact, one early morning. He left the street corner, incidentally, the one on G and State Street, near where the Salvation Army building is now located. He left the street corner strewn with human wrecks. Something of the captain's state of mind can be gained from his comments to the Hoquiam lumbermen after the fight. The Hoquiam resident commented that in beating Charlie Johnson, Whitkena had licked the Aberdeen's town bully. Yeah, said the captain. If I had known that, I would have licked him some more. It was fortunate for Johnson, whose fighting days were now ended by the rough house seagoer, that the captain didn't know his opponent or his opponent's reputation. Any more licking would have finished off Charlie Johnson for good. On a later voyage south to the Golden Gate, the captain had trouble with one of his deckhands. Tiring of the man's attitude, Wickenus seized the sailor, raised him above his head, and slapped him down on the deck. When the schooner reached port, the man was hospitalized for three months. I forgot, captain told the ship's owner. I forgot. This was the last straw for the owners of the Roy Summers, and Wickenot totted his stock of bond stuff out of the ship's cabin and went looking for a new command. About that time, Hanfi and Company, a famous San Francisco fir shipping firm, were looking for a seasoned captain to take over a four-mastered schooner, the A.F. Coates. Wickenot was signed, but the ship, a new sturdy one, she was, soon became the captain's despair. It was too large to sail directly into Gray's Harbor and forced weights at the bar for pilots and tugboats brought gray hairs to the captain's foreflux. However, it was the same schooner, the A.F. Coates, that he brought north on his last trip. He tied it up at Gray's Harbor's commercial company mill in Cosmopolis and after roaring and threatening, swung ashore and hiked across the new railroad bridge that connected Cosmopolis to Junction City. He hiked along it into town and ambled across the new Heron Street span 
that was soon to be made famous by the young man named Megaphone Johnson. And that will be another yarn some other evening from our scrapbook. The burly skipper knew his Gray's Harbor by this, by this time, and he had his favorite spots all located. He had the bars listed as preference, a favorite eating house. Eating was something that occupied very little of his time in port. And in particular, he had an interest in a certain young lady at a certain dance hall. The feminine interest, though not what you could describe as a queen of the dance hall bells, was nevertheless a personable lass, and it was no secret along the roaring skid row that she favored the barrel-chested captain, too. The captain may have made a stop or two before he reached his final destination, which was, as you guessed at the dance hall, where Myra worked. I s said her name was Myra. I'm not sure about that. But one old-timer called, recalled her that, and so Myra Works, who was sweet on the captain, and rather thought that was the one who might figure in the affair. Nor do we have a record of whether Captain was laden with gifts when he showed up at Myra's place, but he usually was. Her friends admired the silk dresses from San Francisco, the Chinese pottery and the incense, the candy and the trinkets that were showered upon her. So, it would be safe to picture him as bulging with packages when he tapped on her door. Now, Myra and I have it from the authority that she was the aggressor in the affair of the heart and was particularly successful on this visit. And when the captain was ready to haul lines and swing down the canal for his run back to San Francisco, everything was arranged for her to return with him. Arrangements were made the last night that he was in port. It was agreed that she would pack her things, have them on the dock at the front of F Street. When the AF coats came down river, Wickenau would make one last stop and take aboard his lady. He gruffly advised her to be on time, then left. Now a sailor on his last night in port can hardly be criticized for malingering a bit. The captain didn't go straight back to his ship. It was bitterly cold and a blustery night. The rain shipped across the river and drove nearly horizontal down the dimly lit streets of the little lumber town. Whitkana made several stops to brace himself for the long walk to Junction City. He had started early. He might have caught a ferry across the river, but Whitkana was not one to be influenced by time or tide. He started late. And the more stops he made, the warmer the rain fell, and the less he objected to the bitterness of the harbor winter. When he crossed the Heron Street Bridge and followed the street towards Wilson's Mill, he rolled with his stride and savored the raining beating against him and the back of his clothes and his shaved neck. He might have swung a new rough verse of a sea shanty. Anyhow, he made no trouble navigating the distance to Junction City in complete darkness, and he found the railroad track that led to the bridge that he had crossed when he just came into port. Stepping down between the ties, he approached the bridge. Now the old Chehalis was running bank deep. There had been a heavy season of the familiar Grays Harbor mist. The steams were in the freshest. It was so dark and the lights of the bridge, colored or white, looked like little pinpoints in the dark. But satisfied that the bridge was there, Whitkana strode on, his great arms swinging at his side, his lumbering gait carrying him at an angle against the wind, and thus, walking by the instinct that guides a mariner in a, this state of being, he nearly walked right out of this state of being. The bridge intended primarily for railroad, which had no trains at this time of night, was open. Captain Whitkana walked off the end of the approach and dropped, twisting and no doubt roaring, into the swirling black waters of the Chehalis. Numb as he was, it would be unfair to say that he was not surprised. He was also a bit befuddled. His stops, the weather, the darkness all contributed, 
and in the rushing waters he lost all sense of direction. He could see nothing but the lights of the bridge, and they were in midstream. He struck out for them, but the tide was running swiftly, and as he swam his powerful arms pulling him along through the water, the river carried him downstream. Now the Chehalis was white at this point. The water was cold, bitterly cold, the night black, and the swimmer, well, hardly in the pink of training. But as he fought, so the captain swam. It was a matter of no quarter. He would like the river, as he had whipped every other man that he had ever faced. He swam and he swam and he swam. It must have been an hour before he bumped something, felt it cold and clung to it. It was a piling. No record or even mentioned how long he held the piling. But after a while, the late morning light came and he saw shore but a hundred yards away. It was the south bank of the river along where the Saginaw Mill stands today. He had swum a good mile downstream, crossed the river, and now he paddled the last yards to shore and dragged himself out. He was weary. His cap was gone, and his slicked down hair hung into his eyes, but he still wore his black box coat with the brass buttons. It was still buttoned as it had been when he hit the water. What would Albert Hubbard have said if he had known the captain? Aye, there was a man, he said, of Rowan who carried the message to Garcia. Aye, there was against, he might have noted, that he had heard Whitkenau's story. While the captain walked upstream in a damp dawn and boarded his waiting ship, she was loaded and ready to sell, and by the time the captain was in dry clothes, his neck swathed in a flannel cloth, was alongside F Street Dock to pick up Mer Myra and her baggage. Captain Wickenau's story fades from this point. He got into another Barbary Coast brawl and was involved in another death. Friends went to his aid, but the law was stern. If he did not serve time, he must surely have been out on probation, for he never sailed the coast again. In an obscure way, he became one of the characters of the San Francisco waterfront that blended into the color of the rough and ready city. How long had he had been gone from the land of the living? I have no record. But I would venture to say that when death came, grinning and beckoning, Captain Wickena, Captain White to some men, gave the grim reaper a fight for his life before he lost his last to the grimmest battle. Well, that was Wickena, probably the roughest, toughest of them all. But there were many others, and some evening when our scrapbook is open, we're going to run down the list of salt-coked masters of sailing days and dig out the personalities of some of those other ships that knew Gray's Harbor when it was very young. Just a recitation of names of the arrays of characters stirring the imagination and the stories about them read like a rip-roaring days in which they live, plastered with adventure and packed with lusty living, and mostly about your hometown and mine, the streets of Gray's Harbor, and the people who walked in them, and ride out into the water of some of them. And incidentally, tomorrow night I'm going to tell you about those two colorful fishmongers, Clam Joe and Joe Clam, the true story of a man who went to sea on the belly of a well and a pair of characters that made Gray's Harbor the most colorful spot on the coast. But that will be tomorrow night's opening of a hometown scrapbook. Thanks for listening. <laughs>